Man, week four, I'm going to have that song stuck in my head in my sleep, man. It's a great song. It's a great song. But to kick things off today, I want to get into a very, very deep spiritual conversation with you. And I want to talk about the topic of pet peeves. What pet peeves do you have? Okay, maybe it's chewing with your mouth open. Maybe it's nails on a chalkboard. Some of mine that I wanted to list off for you. You know, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. And I think he was right, because there are a lot of different things that get under my skin. And some of those include when you're eating with a metal fork or spoon and it brushes against your teeth, that sound, yeah. Uh, Maybe someone who's walking slow in the grocery aisle in the middle of the aisle so I can't even get around them. Uh, Another one is when my daughters, I have a daughter who is almost three and a daughter who's almost seven. And they're always like, why dad? Why? Over and over again. Among other things, but, but the worst of them all, What I think is the most evil pet peeve of all time, this is something that Satan created here, is the zipper merge. Does anyone know what the zipper merge is? Let me jog your memory. I actually got a little diagram up here on the screen. A zipper merge, you you see there's these really nifty signs that let you know ahead of time that the right lane is going to close up ahead, but so many times, you know, you know, got tons of time to get over if you want to, but you always got some guy who thinks he's better than everybody else, who zooms up and cuts in, if we see on the next slide, here cuts right in in front of everybody else and man uh, they are just the worst I just want to say hey wait in line and be miserable like the rest of us okay Um, my wife was like Silas I researched it Um, zipper merging is actually good for traffic flow and I was like honey where I come from that's called cutting in line all right so I think we could all get behind that but the reason I'm talking about all these things these small interactions that bother us is I want us to realize that small interactions um, have a tendency to make a big impact on us. Small interactions with others can impact us greatly. Uh, um, When I think of this in the same way, I think small acts of kindness also should not be underestimated either. I'm convinced that we don't always need the next big social media pastor. We don't always need the next big worship album. What we need is Christians who make their walk of faith more than just once a week walk, but a daily walk. Christians that no matter where they find themselves at, whether it's at the ball field or at the office or at home, wherever they find themselves, they are just permeating the world around them with small acts led by the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit impacting the world around them. In fact, I'd argue that these small interactions have the power and potential to change people's days around them. Like, think about it. Small gestures go a long way. If if you're on your way to work and you you do need to merge over and someone flashes you and waves you over, it feels pretty good. You're like, hey, thanks. And you do the little little car wave thing and you you move over, right? And then on the way home from work, you have to stop at the grocery store and you just needed like eggs or bread or milk, just a couple things. And then there's someone with a giant cart of groceries in front of you. They look behind you and say, hey, you just got a couple things. Go ahead. You're like, hey, thanks, man. Appreciate that. And you're feeling even better about yourself. And this is one of my favorite things. You're at a gas station and the cashier goes, hey, I love your shirt. You're like, thank you. I thrifted it for $6. And and by that time, man, I'm on top of the world just because of three small acts of kindness. And when I get home, I'm ready to love my family more. I'm ready to love my wife more. I'm ready to serve. I just feel amazing. But now I want to flip the script. Uh, Imagine now that you're going to work and you don't know there's an accident ahead and you need to get over, but no one's letting you over. So you assert yourself and cut someone off. They lay on their horn and throw up an obscene hand gesture at you through the rearview mirror. Your blood's already starting to boil. And then on the way home from work, you got your bread and milk. You're in a hurry. You see that light on. The last register has nobody in line. And you're just sprinting for that last register. And right before you get there, an extreme couponer with two giant carts of groceries slides right in front of you and takes your spot. Chances are you're fighting back the urge to dump a gallon of milk on that person's head at that point. And then you go to the gas station, your last stop before home, and your card keeps declining. It's just not working. It's not reading. And the cashier says, hey, if you're just broke, just just let us know. We can spot you, man. And by that time, you're humiliated. You're just not having it. And when you get home, you're viewing your kids more as a bother now. You're just annoyed. They're annoyances to you. You just want to turn on that TV, watch that game, um, veg out on Instagram reels, whatever you do to unwind and decompress. And you're totally ignoring those who matter most in your life. And just like that, we see that small acts of kindness have the power to change lives and small negative interactions have the power to damage 
lives. Um, We've been in this series, What the World Needs Now, and Pastor Dave has dove into scripture that shows us as Christians, God gives us opportunities to live by the Spirit, and when we live by the Spirit, here's what happens. When we live by the Spirit, we restrain the progress of evil in the world. But on the other hand, we also have the opportunity to not live by the Spirit, to live by the flesh. And when Christians choose to live by the flesh, they release the progress of evil in the world around them. I know plenty of people who don't go to church anymore because of one negative interaction someone had at church with a Christian who was living by the flesh. But I also know many stories about people who started coming to church because of one positive interaction of a Christian living by the Spirit, whether it was getting their oil changed, that happened right here at this church, uh, or a coffee shop, or at work, just having a Christian living by the Spirit being a positive interaction in the world around them. And both the encouraging and the scary thing about this is that Christians, we have the choice. We have the choice of which one we are going to choose. In other words, another way to describe that is when you become a Christian and you get baptized, the Holy Spirit enters your heart and begins to change your life from the inside out. And the Holy Spirit starts to remove the old character traits of your sinful life that you had in the past and begins to replace it with new ones that are pure, which are known as the fruit of the Spirit. These are the good character traits that help you transform the world around you. But what happens when you become a Christian is that your old life and your new life begin to battle each other. Some of you know what that feels like. It is not fun. It is a battle between spirit and flesh. Galatians 5 talks about this. We've read this verse a couple times. I want to just jog our memory here. It says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. As Dave touched on last week, the flesh and the spirit, they're constantly at war with one another. And as Christians, you have this choice of which side am I going to let win? Who am I going to be today? What impact? Am I going to live by the spirit or am I going to live by the flesh? So what I want us to do today is I want us to look at the remaining three fruit of the spirit. I want to talk about what do they mean? How do we apply it to our lives? And my prayer is that once we have learned that, we will know how to live it out and how to restrain evil in the world around us. The fruit of the spirit are listed in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And these are the three that we're going to be actually covering tonight to finish up our fruit of the Spirit. And the first one is faithfulness. Faithfulness, it's so fitting that this is the one we start out with because if you can't be faithful, you can't do any of the rest of the fruit of the Spirit. In fact, the word faithfulness, it comes from the Greek word um, pistis, which is the character of one who can be trusted. The character of one who can be trusted. And just to break this down a little bit further here, the word faith means I trust someone else. Maybe it's a friend that you trust and you count on. Maybe it is a spouse. Maybe it's a best friend. Maybe it's a pastor or your faith in God, your trust in God. Faith is I can trust someone else. But faithfulness is someone else can trust me. Someone else can trust me. And let me just ask you, are you a trustworthy person? Or in the words of Vince Vaughn, do you have a problem, a real, real problem? Okay. So something my dad always showed me, this was the time I was being a complete knucklehead and I broke my dad's trust. I was a teenager. I don't remember what I did, probably something really stupid, but he sat me down at our kitchen table and he set a coffee mug, just a plain coffee mug on our kitchen table. And he sat me down and he made me just sit here and stare at this thing. Okay. I'm still staring at this plain coffee mug. And then he broke out a little bottle of water. It's the kind with the spout top that you can open and close. But he opened it just enough so the water could just kind of slowly drip down into the mug, drop by drop. And he had me just sit there and stare at it. And I'm just sitting there with a bad attitude as a teenager. I'm like, dad, what am I doing this? This thing, what what is the point of this? My dad said, shh, watch. And it just kept dripping. I'm just bored out of my, my mind. It's taking forever. I'm like, what is the point? Is this my torture punishment here? What is going on right now? And then finally, the mug filled up. It took about half an hour for that mug to fill up. And I just sat there staring at it. I was like, all right, dad, now what? Now what? My dad stood up. 
he picked up the mug, he walked over to the kitchen sink, and he just dumped it out in the kitchen sink. I was like, Dad, what in the world? You made me sit here and watch that thing. We're not even going to drink it. What, what, are, what is the point of that? And then my dad looked at me and he said this, trust is slow to build, but quick to destroy. Don't break my trust again. And I was like, wow, that, that meant so much to me because I realized like, he's like, Man, I, trust is so hard to build. Faithfulness is so hard to build that trust with someone else, but you could lose it in an instant. Um, it's just so easily broken. Um, my daughter and I, she has this thing, Piper, on the way home from school, she's kind of memorized which Halloween decorations are on the way home because she has this thing where she's like terrified of Halloween decorations. So anytime she would know where one of these really scary houses were, she would cover her eyes and she'd say, Daddy, is the scary Halloween house gone? I'd say, yes, sweetie. And she would open her eyes again. And she would do this like every single day. It happened even last week. And last week I was feeling kind of like a silly goose. I don't know what got into me, all right? I was headed home and my daughter was covered covering her eyes. And I said, she was like, daddy, are we past the scary house? I'm like, almost. And I just decided, I knew what house she was talking about in my neighborhood. It had a 12 foot like skeleton in the front yard, walking like a six foot skeleton dog. I don't know where you get that at, but that's what they had. So I decided to pull in front of that house. And I told her, I'm like, Hey, there's your friend out the window. And she looked and there was like a skeleton right out the window from her. And you would have thought it was Kevin McAllister from home alone. She let out this giant blood curdling scream. Needless to say, I gotta build some trust with my daughter again. But on a serious note, as Christians who carry the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I believe we should be the most authentic and trustworthy people on the planet. A lot of the biggest issues that our church faces or the church in general, the capital C church faces today is when there are bad examples of this. A lack of faithfulness, whether it be to God or a spouse or our brothers and sisters in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.9 says this, God is faithful and by him you were called to fellowship of his son Jesus, Jesus Christ our Lord. That shows that we serve a faithful and trustworthy savior and he calls us to be like him. And if we as the church can't even figure this out, how do we expect the world to trust in Jesus? And I just want to answer the question, how can we as a church, as Christians, be a people who are characterized by faithfulness? And I'm going to hit three things really quick, just looking at this fruit of the Spirit. And I believe the first way we can be a people characterized by faithfulness is faithfulness to our spouse. Like throughout Scripture, we see for those who are married here in the house tonight, we see that throughout Scripture, the church is referred to as the bride of Christ. And Christ represents the groom. And it just means that marriage is so much more than just a marriage between one man and one woman for life. But it's also a picture of Christ's faithfulness to us and his unconditional love for us. So that means when we are unfaithful to our spouse, not only are we hurting the person that matters most in our lives, but we're also painting a false picture of what Jesus' love for us looks like. And I think sometimes we need to check ourselves. Are you characterized by faithfulness? Or do you go to church with your family and when you go home, you sneak off somewhere to go on that website again? Uh, do you worship Jesus with your lips, but at work you're getting a little too close to that person because they make you feel good inside and then maybe they listen better than our person at home? Little do, do you know that feelings come and go, but your family's forever, they are counting on you. D do you have a Bible verse on your social media bio, but inside you're worshiping the false God of lust in every person you see? And that's why 30% of evangelical Christian marriages end in divorce. That's one, that's one in three. That's scary. Faithfulness to our spouse. The next is faithfulness to our church. The people in this room, our brothers and sisters in Christ, are we faithful to one another? That when we need something, we chip in to help. That when they need prayer, they can count on us. Or do we treat this more like a spiritual buffet? Like, oh, I like that worship song. I like that part of the message, but I didn't like the rest of it. Uh, um, man, I, I like kind of going to this program. I like that they have something for my kids. I like that I can go to this. That's all great. But there's gotta be a point that we're not just takers, but we're also givers. Are we faithful to give financially? Are we faithful to give and help someone in need from our church? Are we willing to show up to someone when they're in the hospital or they need our help? Are we faithful to our church because God has created us for each other, for community. Are we faithful to our church? We can't do this alone. 
And then the third is faithfulness to our God. And so many times when we think of the idea of sin, we think of the punishment of sin or the consequences for our actions. But do we ever think about how our sin breaks the heart of God? We so often fail to recognize that sin, just like cheating on, a, on, on our spouse and it might break their heart, when we sin against God, we break the heart of God. It's the same picture. We are the bride of Christ and we can be spiritually unfaithful. So when we choose sin over God, we are effectively choosing spiritual idolatry, worshiping something that is not God, worshiping the things of this world, but we're also committing spiritual adultery because we are cheating on God and not putting him as the number one priority and he is a jealous God when we choose sin over him. And we like to talk about God's faithful, unchanging love for us no matter what. But what about our faithful love to him? Because he is so worthy of all of our love and all of our affection. Faithfulness to your spouse, faithfulness to your church, and faithfulness to God is how we can be a people characterized by the fruit of the spirit of faithfulness. And let me tell you, trustworthy people are in short supply today. And when you meet one, it is a breath of fresh air. So you being faithful in the small things every day to be a trustworthy person at your workplace or wherever you find yourself is a breath of fresh air to those around you and is a huge part of repressing the darkness in our world. The next fruit we're covering is gentleness. And when I think of the word gentleness, sometimes my head automatically goes to my grandma's house. And I think every grandma in the world owns this painting of Jesus right here. Go to your grandma's house and do a little scavenger hunt and see if this painting of Jesus isn't hanging up in your grandmother's house. This is this picture of Jesus holding the lost sheep, right? I love that picture because I think that is a picture that represents gentleness perfectly. It, it, you see Jesus, this lost sheep who ran away. And we like to think that this, this sweet picture of Jesus, is, this is all that it is. But in reality, I think a mistake people make when they see this word gentleness is they associate it with weakness. And Jesus isn't weak. In fact, if you study the Greek word for gentleness, you'll see that it actually, it takes a stronger person to show gentleness it takes someone who has a strong willpower no matter what, because if you are the dumb lost sheep running away over and over and over again, it takes a lot of faithfulness and steadfastness to keep pursuing the lost sheep no matter how many mistakes they make. The word in Greek has this implication of the power to endure offense with restraint. The power to endure offense without restraint. And if you're anything like me, that takes a lot of willpower, especially when someone's offended me They've hurt me, they've betrayed me, they've annoyed me. To show great strength and in, in not seek revenge or not retaliate in any way, that takes a great deal of restraint. And that is gentleness. And what I want us to understand here is the world says react, gentleness says wait. The world says react, gentleness says wait. I think all of us have known someone in our life before who just reacted to everything. They reacted, they almost had this instinctual, immediate response when someone would mess up and they would just be on you, they'd be yelling at you, they'd be angry at you. And when you were around that person, your anxiety would go up, your stress would go up. Maybe it was a coach, maybe it was a parent, maybe it was a boss. And this person just made you feel so just like scared. It's like walking on eggshells to be around them. But then many of us also probably know someone in our life who was gentle in spirit and they would wait. If we did something wrong, they would be slow to correct. They would be patient. They would wait a minute. Uh, they, would be, they would calm down before they spoke to us, make us feel safe. They were people who were happy to teach us and not just yell at us, to affirm us, not belittle us, to coach us, not just punish us. They're people that you can't seem to find a whole lot more anymore, but when you're around them, you just feel safe around them. You just feel like you can rest and trust in their presence. I don't know who that was for you. In my life, um, it was actually my own mom and also my grandparents, but all of us have someone who just had a spirit of gentleness when you were around them. And between these two, who do you want to be? Because you have the choice as a Christian when you come home to walk in and have a spirit of reacting and you're bringing stress and you're bringing anxiety into your home. You come home, maybe it's a disaster. Your kid's got a million things out all over the floor. That's what my house looks like. And you just want to blow up like, man, has anybody cleaned this house? Has anybody done anything? And you can be just on a war path, letting everyone's anxiety level shoot up. And you could just bring arguments and confrontation with you. Or you could walk in and bring a spirit of gentleness 
that makes everyone inside the house feel at peace and calm and close to God and a person that someone wants to seek peace and confide in. Between these two, who do you want to be? Because I know who Jesus was. Jesus was someone that people wanted to be around because he was gentle in spirit. He says it about himself in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 29. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and humble at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus is both gentle and humble at heart. And we get small everyday opportunities to reflect Christ in that way, to be a gentle spirit, because it's tough out there right now. People don't have a spirit of gentleness. They have a spirit of harshness. And I think all of us know that. And sometimes we contribute to the problem. But as Christians, we have an opportunity to shun our flesh and focus on living in the spirit to provide that gentleness to others around us. And when people see that in the middle of a storm, it gives them peace. And when you do that, it restrains evil in this world around you. You have to have gentleness. And the final fruit of the Spirit we'll be going over in this entire series is, this, is the fruit of self-control. Uh, I, I don't know why this ends up happening, but every time I feel like I get up here, I tell some sort of crazy McDonald's story. Maybe it's Jesus telling me that I need to stop going to McDonald's. Um, but anyways, I got another one today. This happened to me and my daughter Piper, who was five at the time. Um, and we were driving in the car, going to get some McDonald's before a camping trip. And it was one of those deals where it was taking longer than normal. Like it was like 45 minutes until we got the order. But part of me was like, I've waited this long. I might as well get my food and get out of here if I've committed this much time and energy. And it was one of those drive throughs where you alternated left, right, left, right. You know what I'm talking about. It's like the one over here. And it came time that I was at the front of the line, but I was zoning out because of how long the line was taking. And I kind of snapped out of it. I was like, oh, is it my turn or the person next to me? I don't know. And I was kind of looking over. And I saw that the person wasn't going anywhere on my left. So I just decided like, okay, I guess I'll go. Next thing you know, I got this guy hanging out of the window, yelling, screaming colorful things to me, just going absolutely ballistic. And I kind of rolled down the window. I was like, hey, sorry, man, I didn't, I didn't notice. He's like, you don't have to lie to me, followed by a lot of other explicitive words. And I was just like, he was just going crazy for like 10 minutes behind me. And my daughter Piper was like, daddy, why is that man freaking out? And I was like, honey, He's an angry, angry man. But anyways, and for eight more minutes, that guy just was yelling at me and swearing at me through the line. It was just so terrible. I kind of had this moment of weakness where I wanted to take my large drink and chuck it behind me and drive off. But the spirit helped restrain the evil in me. It helped me live by the spirit and choose not to do that. Because I had this thought. Um, one thing I love that our high school pastor Chaz told me that I've always loved is that he says, when you feel the Holy Spirit talking to you, it's like a thought that's not your own. And in that moment, I had a thought that was not my own that said, hey, you don't know what this guy's going through. You don't know if he just had a divorce, if he's having a bad day at work. You don't know if he just lost a loved one or is just, just not having a good day. And maybe you were the last straw in that person's life and they took it out on you. Like a 4th of July firework, their fuse was this close and you just happened to be the last person to bug them that day. And I don't always think like that. Like my mind thinks, I want to react, I want to retaliate. But the Holy Spirit helped me use self-control in that moment and realize, man, you don't know what's going on in that person's life. And it also showed me that even a small act of, of negative interaction could affect your day. Because we ended up going camping. I just, the whole time, I was just not enjoying myself. I kept thinking to that one small moment. But if we're being honest, I think all of us have moments in that life where, in our life where we lost self-control, right? All of us have had moments in our life where we mess up or we struggle and we end up sinning and give in to temptation. The word in the New Testament for, for this refers to sinful urges. It's something natural that comes to us because of our sin nature. Think about it. You don't have to teach a child to be selfish, right? What is the second word a child learns after mommy and daddy? It's mine, right? They take the toy, they're like, mine. That's what my daughters did at least. I was like, hey, you got to share. She's like, no, mine. Okay, so it's, it's mommy, daddy, no, then mine. That's kind of the order there. Um, another thing is you don't have to teach a child to seek revenge. I've seen uh, when my, my da little daughter Sadie is interacting with other little kids and one of them takes a toy from her, she grabs the nearest object and just whacks them with it, okay? You don't have to teach children revenge or any sin because it comes naturally to us because of our sin nature. And if we're being honest, a lot of us have things that we struggle with self-control on. It could be your tongue and the words that you say do not, that don't glorify Jesus. 
Maybe some of us need to take the Jesus fish off our car because we love Jesus, but we don't always drive like Jesus. Uh, for others, it could be a short fuse that causes us to blow up on people. In, in an effort to demand respect, we end up losing all respect because we blow up on everybody. We have the fuse the size of a candle wick. And just like that cup of water my dad told me about, you could build up all this trust with people, but in one moment of lack of self-control, you could lose it all with someone. And I know people in my life right now who are in prison currently because of one moment where they snapped and they were, instead of waiting, they reacted. And they had a moment of weakness where they did not exhibit the fruit of the spirit of self-control and it had major consequences, guys. We have to get these things under control. But how do we do that? 2 Corinthians 10.5 gives us the answer. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. It's this picture of mastery over our urges. It's this picture of being able to dominate and control and tackle and essentially submit that thought that is evil or wrong and force it to obey Christ. Every single thought, because a thought is what turns into a temptation which turns to sin. But if you could stop it right when it comes, that's what Jesus wants you to do. That is a fruit of the Spirit to control those sinful urges. And man, when you do that, it changes the world around you because we are a reactive society. We are so accustomed to just people screaming and yelling at each other as soon as they get mad, just reacting to everything. But when you can be a person who exhibits self-control, it changes the world around you. When you're at the restaurant and that young lady is, is the person waiting on you, and you, they write, maybe they write down your order wrong and they come back out with your food and they can tell on your face, that is not what I ordered. They're thinking, oh man, here it comes. Just imagine what's going through that, that young waitress's head. Like, oh man, here it comes. They're gonna blow up at me. They're gonna yell at me like everyone else. What are they gonna do? What are they gonna say? Are they gonna curse me out? Instead they say, hey, it's okay. They're like, whoa, okay. I'm so sorry about that. I'll get that fixed right away. Your ability to exhibit self-control is a light in the middle of a dark world because that waitress might have expected something completely different, but you living like Jesus could change their life. Uh, I love that we could be a light in this dark world because here's the thing about this lost and broken world. There are people who are watching us and we have the opportunity to paint a picture of what Jesus is really like, but we also have an opportunity to paint a false picture of what Jesus is like. And it's all dependent upon whether or not we choose to live by the Spirit or whether we choose to live by the flesh in the way we live our lives. What are we going to do? What picture are we going to paint? How are we going to be faithful in the small things? One of my favorite movie series of all time is the Lord of the Rings series. And the author, J.R.R. Tolkien, in one of his characters, I believe it was Gandalf, he has this line that I love. And this is the line that he wrote here. I have found that it is the small everyday deed of ordinary folks that keep the darkness at bay. Small acts of kindness and of love. The world we live in is watching us, but never underestimate the power of a small deed performed in the power of the Spirit. It's easy, so easy to get caught up in this idea of, man, I don't play guitar on stage. Uh, I'm not an evangelist who speaks to thousands of people. Um, I don't go on mission trips to Romania and help trafficked orphans. I haven't had the money to do that or the time to do that with my work schedule. I'm not an influencer, a Christian influencer with thousands of followers I share Bible verses with every single day. But you need to realize that's not the primary way God expands his kingdom. The primary way God expands his kingdom is ordinary people like you and I in our small everyday interactions with one another that are keeping the darkness at bay. Small opportunities that God gives us to be a part of something far greater than we ever could add up. If we were to add up every small interaction of every single person in this room, we would realize that we're part of something far greater than we think. But we have to be faithful in the small things. I've always been an Animal Planet guy. Okay, I love watching Animal Planet. Even since I was a young guy, I've been just fascinated with God's creation. And this really cool species of animal I saw on one of the shows was called army ants. And something really neat that army can, ants can do is they make these things called a living bridge. I got some pictures up here. And essentially what they can do is they can use their own bodies and span bridges 10 to 20 ants body lengths long to cross paths that would be feasibly unimaginable. 
If they were to do it on their own and they seem to defy the laws of physics and gravity, you can like Google pictures of this. Like there's crazy living ant bridges you can see online. Like it is so bizarre. There's even one crazy one where they're like attacking a wasp nest. Go check that out later. It's crazy down that rabbit hole. But I was like, man, this is so neat because that just looks impossible. But when they come together, they can accomplish something amazing piece by piece. And I think that is the plan that God has for us. It's each of us every day choosing to live by the power of the Holy Spirit to restrain Satan and what he's doing in this world and and being a part of and magnifying what Jesus is doing in the world. And when we do the small things and we come together, we're a part of something far greater than we could ever, ever imagine. And I just want that to be our call today. So when you leave today, you're actually going to be getting a wristband, and it has our series title on here, What the World Needs Now. It's got our theme verse in in Galatians on the back. And what I want you to do on your way out is you're going to take one of these wristbands, and I want it to serve as a reminder for you that no matter where you find yourself, I want you to remind yourself to live by the Spirit and not by the flesh, to be an everyday kingdom worker, to be faithful in the small things, because when we come together and we leave this place, we can just realize that we are part of something far, far greater. Live by the Spirit. That's what the world needs now. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I want to thank you for who you are. God, this, I realize this bracelet's just a small piece of, of silicone plastic, but I pray that it would mean so much more to us when we wear this thing that it would mean something to us. It would remember um, in Galatians, in your word, God, where it says that the fruit of the Spirit, where it says how we are to live as Christians and how we are to impact the world around us, God. I pray you could use each and every one of us to be a formidable force against the darkness, that we could live by the Spirit and restrain the darkness around us, that we could live by faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, that we could make an impact with those around us. And Jesus, I pray that we could just be faithful, that we can model that to the world. Because God, we can talk about all these things all day long, but if we're not faithful, it means nothing. So God, I pray that we could be people characterized by faithfulness, a people characterized by your Christ-like love, and a people who are a light in the darkness. Jesus, help us to be what the world needs now. Amen.